If you can hold on to land right now for the next two to three years, it's going to be triple its value just because there's nobody building right now. If you look at building permits, we're over 50% down year over year because a lot of people don't know where the market's going, so they don't even want to build. Most people think wholesaling, they think rentals, they think fix and flip. They don't really think about land. And guess what they're not making any more of? Land. If you're going to wholesale land, find a good way to bring it to a price that makes sense for a developer because too many people will go hey well market value 60 I, i'm gonna sell my lot for 60 and then it never moves because builders are not buying at retail prices when you're getting into real estate if you don't have a bunch of money you have to use your time and use your time to bring value to someone who has money or your time to bring value to someone who has the knowledge of how to do a deal how to do the construction and that's where the opportunity is for what we do because a lot of builders don't want to waste that year to two years getting those plans approved they want to keep their guys building immediately so that's why they're willing to pay a premium on fully entitled land because they don't have to sit there and risk the money the permits are ready they just walk in they start building this is the mr burr show Welcome back to the show, everybody. Today is going to be an awesome episode. You guys are going to get so much value. I've got one of my great friends on here to talk about buying land. Most people, they want to get into real estate. There's so many different ways to do it. Most people think wholesaling. They think rentals. They think fix and flip. They don't really think about land. And guess what they're not making any more of? Land. So, it's going to be a great episode for you guys. I hope you get a ton of value. When you do, make sure to share the episode because if we all learn together, we can all grow together. So without further ado, Anthony Pappas, welcome to the show, my man. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Of course, brother. So obviously I know you well. We go back a few years, but for those that don't, let's, uh, let's give them kind of a, a backstory, kind of who you are, how you came up and what you're doing nowadays. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been in the real estate game, especially land for about five years now. Before that, I was a plumber for uh, as long as I can remember. Ever since I got out of high school, I was a plumber and did that for a little over a decade and realized uh, there's got to be a better way to make money that doesn't require me killing myself every day in the Arizona heat, digging up sewer lines. So I uh, started looking at wholesale originally, uh, got connected with Steve Trang and said, hey, this looks like a pretty cool opportunity to make some quick cash and start investing in real estate and building some passive income. And then I kind of fell into land because it seemed like a lot of people didn't know how to evaluate it, how to go after it. And uh, it became my niche pretty quick after a couple early successes. Then we pivoted the entire wholesale business directly to land then started stacking some cash, getting into the entitlement and into some rezoning, then to uh, selling some land on notes, which has been pretty awesome as well. That's new, right? Selling land on notes. Yeah, relatively new in the last year and a half. Nice. Okay. So if someone's uh, new to real estate, and like I was saying, they they know wholesaling, they've heard about that. Uh, most people try to get to that first, which makes sense because the the barrier of entry is lower. But talk about the barrier of entry with land, how that would work. So it's very similar to wholesaling houses. You just need to know things a little different. Like a house, you're looking at you know ARV. How much of repairs am I going to need? You know, is it a good neighborhood? That kind of stuff with land. You just need to know the development costs or what the highest and best use of the land is going to be. So it's a little bit of a different learning curve. But when you when you go after it, there's way less competition. On the other side, there's a lot less buyers too because there's if you lock up a good house at a decent price, you got flippers, you got long-term investors, you got Airbnb, you have a ton of buyers for it. Land is a little bit smaller of a buyer pool. And that could be why there's a little bit less competition as well. People going after it because uh, you need to, if you're going to wholesale land, find a good way to bring it to a price that makes sense for a developer. Because too many people will go, hey, well, market value 60. I, I'm going to sell my lot for 60 and then it never moves because builders are not buying at retail prices. Yeah. So how did you kind of learn that and get around that that curve of where to price it, how to how to find the zoning, all that stuff? And so a lot of it came from my plumbing career. I used to do this for other people. You know, I'd build houses for other people. So I had a kind of an insight to what it took to get these vacant pieces of land up to where it's a usable so we can start building a house. So that, that definitely helped. But a lot of the information is for free on the city websites. They really give out as much information as possible because they want builders to build because it helps, you know, increase neighborhood value, 
it uh, brings in more tax money for the state. So a lot of the cities will have stuff on their websites uh, with the planning and zoning department saying, hey, here's the steps you got to go through. Here's the fees you can expect. And uh, a lot of people don't want to do the boring work of just going on the city website and reading document after document. But that's really how I got my start was doing that boring work that a lot of people ignored. And now you uh, you have someone that does it for you, hired someone out? Yeah, so now we have uh, some good entitlement attorneys that we work with where I'll bring a site, say, hey, do you see any issues with this? And they'll say no. So then the entitlement attorney um, takes a quick look at it, you know, make sure we're not going to run into any issues. Then we start with the due diligence phase on the lots that we're going to entitle or rezone. Oh, we get our Alta, our Geotech, our phase one, all those surveys needed to make sure there's no issues with the lot. Then we bring out an, our architect and engineer, and that's when we start getting those plans put together. Love it. So... So you hired that out. Obviously, someone's doing it now, but how long did you do it before you hired that person? It was a few years. Uh, back when I had more time than money, I was doing it all myself to try to keep the overhead low and make sure the margins were good on the deals. And then as you start to build some wealth, stacking some cash, now you can start sourcing that out so you can keep chasing deals and finding more opportunities to keep everything rocking and rolling. Guys, rewind that and listen to that like 30 times. Um he had more time than money. That is huge. When you're getting into real estate, sometimes you have a bunch of money. Sometimes you don't. And your best friend is your time. Like I remember when I first got into real estate, I, um, I teamed up with Templeton Walker. So that was my mentor. And, um, I had a little bit of money, but I had so much time. I had more time than he had. Cause he had all these businesses and things he was doing. So what did I do? I just spent a ton of time searching for deals. And that was the value that I brought to him is I'm finding these deals and teeing them up to him. He doesn't have to search for them because he doesn't have the time to do it. I had the time. So I'm searching for these deals, searching for these deals, searching for these deals. And then I'd send them to him and he'd say, oh, it's not a deal because of this. Oh, it's not a deal because of that. And then I started realizing I was able to look through deals a lot faster because I knew what was and wasn't a deal. And then I'd give it to him. Yeah, it's a deal. Let's do it. So then we would JV it. So guys, it's so important to understand when you're getting into real estate, if you don't have a bunch of money, you have to use your time and use your time to bring value to someone who has money or your time to bring value to someone who has the the knowledge of how to do a deal, how to do the construction. So dude, I love it, man. That's so important. And I think it's, it's something that a lot of people forget is like your time is a valuable asset, probably the most valuable. Would you agree? 100%. And a lot of people getting into land too are just going off of sale comps. And if you're new to something, you got to check the ego at the door. And I'm, I'm still checking my ego every time I get in a room with, you know, bigger investors. Cause if you think, you know, everything you're going to miss out on all the things you really don't know. And I mm -hmm. can't tell you how many people I've tried to help in the land space. And they're like, no, you're wrong. Cause comps are selling for, you know, hundred K a lot in this area. And I'm like, those are for retail buyers. They have water meters, they have sewer connections. Your lot has none of these things. And unfortunately, instead of taking that uh, constructive criticism, they assume I'm wrong. And then I see it go out on every dispo blast list. And three months later, it's uh, still not sold. And the, you know, the next person locked it up at the same price. So if you're new to it, we're all students of the game. And some of us just have a little more knowledge and have seen a little more than, you know, the next person. And you just got to try to take that criticism and say, okay, maybe I did make a mistake. I appreciate you looking at it. Um, where can I, you know, get this to make sense instead of saying, no, you're wrong. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for two months. Um, so that's, that's something I've experienced a lot with a lot of people getting into the spaces, coming in with way too much ego um, and taking it personal when someone says it's a bad deal. We're not saying you're bad at what you're doing. We're not saying you're a bad person, but the numbers just don't work. And as soon as you step back and detach from that deal and say, this isn't me they're mad at, this is, it's just a bad deal. It can really help people grow a lot faster. And that's something I made those same mistakes and that's why I can speak confidently to it. I love it. Dude, someone once told me, I forget who it was, that ego stands for edging God out. That tracks, yeah. Really cool if you think about it because when, when you have an ego, it's all about you, right? You're the center of everything. It's like, no, I'm right. My ego, right? Yeah. But it's not about you. If I mean, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Christ. And I think if, if you edge God out, you have an ego, 
nothing good is going to happen at the end of the day. So um, checking your ego at the door is huge, especially when you get into these rooms. I mean, we've been in some big rooms. So let's talk about that, like the importance of getting around people that move and shake and that are on a different level than you are. Uh, the, the rising tide lifting all boats, right? But if you're in a, a swimming pool, it's not connected to that tide. You're not going anywhere. And you can be the biggest boat in that swimming pool, but it's not going anywhere. And getting into those bigger rooms where you're uncomfortable, where I like being the dumbest and brokest in any room I'm in because I'm just going to keep look, you know, rising to that level of competition around me. I'm a little bit of a competitive person. So if I'm in a room and I'm like all proud of myself, yeah, I brought in 1.5 million revenue last year. And the next day I was like, oh well, yeah, that was our January. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to do a little better. And it uh, just even some of the offhand comments, you'll hear uh, someone dropping like some CPA knowledge or how they put money into their whole life policy and were able to reinvest it and stuff that you normally wouldn't even hear if you weren't in those rooms. And I know a lot of people uh, have a hard time when they're first getting started, leaving that old friend group behind because like, oh, I don't I don't want to change. But the best thing I ever did was leave the old me behind to become who I want to be in this life. And that takes killing that ego and realizing what got you here isn't going to get you where you want to go. And that's something I've uh, still struggle with on occasion, but tried to do. Uh, I think we all do. It's, it's, it's human nature to kind of rest on your laurels, so to speak, and, and get comfortable. I mean, if you think about there's fast food, that's because people want convenience. They want comfort. There's, um, there's Netflix, right? What, what came before Netflix? Blockbuster used to have to go and get a movie and rent it. And then you have to bring it home, watch it. And then I might be dating myself, but once you watched it, you'd have the VHS and you'd put it in the little rewinder. And if you didn't do it, they'd charge you because they'd have to rewind it. Exactly. And now there's Netflix. It's convenient. It's easy. It's comfortable. So it's human nature guys, but you have to break that because, um, Everything great lives on the other side of your comfort zone. Everything. I'll give you guys a great example. Um, in March, I was out in New Zealand and everyone was bungee jumping. I've never bungee jumped. I was absolutely terrified. Every time I'd see someone go, I'm like, oh my God, that looks so freaking scary. I don't know if I could do it. Everyone's going for hours. Everyone's doing it. I'm like, I should probably just do it. Stop being a freaking poo nanny and just do it but the whole time i'm like getting scared just thinking about doing it right yeah what if the cord breaks what if something happens blah blah, blah. finally i end up doing it. i'm the last person to go and i'm up there shaking like a freaking leaf and the 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 girl is tying my stuff she's messing with me she's like ah i don't know if that's put on there right is it with her accent and i'm like i don't know I'm laughing along, but like, I'm like, please don't mess this up. Yeah. I'm up there. I'm inching out. I I didn't look down because I would have probably, I probably would have backed up off of it. All right. I'm just looking out there. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so scared. I jumped for a split second. I was terrified and then just exhilarating, bro. The most amazing, like freeing feeling. And as soon as that chord hit, I was like, I'm not dead. And then it shot me back up. I was like, whoa. This is amazing. So guys, I was so out of my comfort zone, but I did it. And for, I don't know how long I was in the air, maybe 10 seconds. Yeah. Exhilarating. Amazing. So you're right, man. Everything you, uh, you want and need in life, you have to like push through your comfort zone and your barriers, right? There's an old, uh, there's an old quote that touches on that exact subject. I believe it's Socrates, I be, could be misquoting, it's we often suffer more in imagination than reality. So we often mm -hmm. think about how terrible something's going to be, then you go do it, and it's not even close to how you imagined it. It's just how we are as humans. We always overthink, overanalyze, overprepare, and then you go do it, and you're like, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought. And the same thing with real estate investing. We always think, oh, you know, if this deal doesn't work out, I'm going to lose all this money, and it's going to be the end of the world, and then you realize you go make that money back the next month on one more deal that falls in your lap. Yeah. How many times have you lost money in real estate? Three. Okay. And it's all, it's every time I try to do hard money lending. <laughs> I got to teach you something, bro. Yeah. I'm, I'm always too optimistic 
and put too much faith in it. And that's why I've learned never lend in a second position and don't lend without collateral because uh oh plan. dude, yes. You have to have collateral. You can lend in second position as long as the deal is really, really solid. Um, I really won't do it. I'll only do first position um, with collateral. And then another thing I always try to do is get a personal guarantee. So guys, when you're lending, you're, you're lending to an LLC. You don't lend to an individual. Never do that. You lend to an LLC from an LLC and then get a personal guarantee because if that LLC defaults, you can then go after their personal belongings, their car, their house, what what have you. So, um, damn, dude, so you lost money three times, huh? In yeah. lending. Yeah. Anything well, as uh, far as... Uh, two of the guys are still slowly making payments, trying to make it right. We'll see. Uh, uh, one okay. guy just ran into some additional financial difficulties, he said, and uh, isn't able to keep making his monthly payments. So it's a learning experience. Just like you pay to go to college, uh, you got to pay to... And then listen to your mentors. Uh, a good mentor of mine, Annie Dragonova, looked at the deal and she said, I don't see opportunity here. And I was like, ah, nah, she, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's only flipped, you know, 500 houses and wow. built a giant, uh, I don't know how many figures on top of that tech company that she built. And I'm like, ah, no, nah, she's wrong. It's going to be a good deal. And uh, looking back, I should have taken the advice that was given. But Shout out to Annie. Shout out to uh, Steve Trang earlier. Oh, good people out here in the Phoenix market. So let's talk about that. Like how, um, how competitive it is in the Phoenix market. I know you said with land, it's less competitive, but is there still a lot of competition being that we're just in Phoenix and it's like the Mecca of real estate, it seems like. Oh, Phoenix is cutthroat, especially when you get into the larger parcels, because that's where it gets highly competitive because you have large brokerages and large developers going after the land and they have acquisition arms. But when you're normally looking at the info lots, it used to be a lot less competitive. But as wholesaling itself kind of dried up on the houses, when uh, you know the large hedge funds stopped buying, these wholesale groups needed to try to find a way to bring in some more capital, and then they started going after land. So the competition on the land side in Phoenix is definitely picking up. You have to know your numbers a lot better. You have to be a little more proficient in your sales abilities. That So we are getting some more competition just as people are trying to survive and find other ways to bring in some capital to make up for the stuff that was there before so it is it's phoenix is a rough market we're also dabbling in florida and texas as well just to kind of diversify a few different markets to see some more opportunity what's it going to be like um virtually are you guys just going to wholesale the land a uh, majority of it unless uh if we really like the land we'll take it down and title it sell it off fully approved or uh, looking to build a couple duplexes and fourplexes in texas and florida Texas or Florida, we were going gangbusters and we had a little over a hundred thousand in potential revenue on the board from a few deals we had locked up in the uh, beginning of the year. And then February, the uh, federal government stepped in and said, Florida can no longer issue permits in the wetlands. And mm -hmm. all these deals are in the wetlands, but nobody cared because they could get building permits. The federal government completely shut that down. So all those deals we had on the board just wiped. So really understanding the market you're in is crucial to your success, especially if you're dealing with wetlands, flood zones, anything like that, because uh, uh, local governments or federal governments could uh, destroy what you're doing. And thankfully, we didn't personally close on any of those deals because we'd be sitting on land that we overpaid for waiting for this uh, lawsuit between Florida and the government to go through. And what are wetlands? Uh, just like protected areas, kind of like marshlands in a way. I'm still not an expert on wetlands, and maybe I should have learned a little bit more before diving in. But yeah, it's just protected areas. Um, in Florida that you normally could get a building permit, raise up the pad out of the water level or, you know, potential flood level and then build. But yeah, they shut that all down. So it's a, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. Hmm. Okay. So when it comes to land, it's a, it's a longer game, right? Like if you, let's say you buy a house um, that's dilapidated and you get some contractors in there, you fix it up. We're talking if they freaking do what they're supposed to do. And we're talking maybe three, four month project. Right. Um, with land, completely different, right? So you have to go through the the county with zoning. You have to do excavating if you're going to build something. Like, have you done any projects from like buying the land and then going through all the steps to like building something from the ground up? So we've gone from buying the land to full entitlement, and then that's normally when we exit. 
a lot of builders, and that's where the opportunity is for what we do, because a lot of builders don't want to waste that year to two years getting those plans approved. They want to keep their guys building immediately. So that's why they're willing to pay a premium on fully entitled land because they don't have to sit there and risk the money. The, the permits are ready. They just walk in, they start building. So that's where we've kind of found our bread and butter is in the entitlement side of things is getting these projects fully approved so then they can just step in and start building. But the longest one we've done is the most recent one. It's a 10 unit and it's taken over two years because there are some easements that we had to remove and it's been a, a bureaucratic nightmare of talking to all the different departments and city and government and everything. It's been quite quite the ordeal, but we finally got approvals last month and so we're looking to uh, sell the property now, working with a couple different builders seeing who's uh, wanting to take it. So for people that don't know, what is uh, entitlement? Entitlement is just getting plans fully approved. You're getting all of the city documents done. You're get So when you first get the lot, it's just raw land. This was zoned appropriate. It was already zoned for multifamily, so we didn't have to go through a rezone and change any of that. We just had to go into the city, say, here's our plans. This is what we want to build. Will you approve it? And then it has to go through all the different checks um, through the city departments, and they all sign off saying, yes, you can do this. A lot of times they'll kick back comments. We don't want the fire hydrant there. You need to move it 100 feet there. So then it all goes back to the architect and the engineer. They redo everything. You resubmit. And then the next guy says, well, actually, I want the driveway 10 feet this way. And then you got to go say, well, per the code, it doesn't have to be there. Um, so we're going to leave it here. Then it goes back through another round of revisions. And it's just, it's a snowball effect. But it's a, there's a reason why a lot of builders don't want to do it. Because you're going to lose a lot of hair and a lot of sleep over it. But there's yeah. also a lot of opportunity doing it. Because a lot of other people don't want to do that. Because it is... Uh, cash heavy and it does come with a lot of risk because if you're wrong you could lose a lot of money i bet and what's uh so people know easement what's that so an easement is a piece of land that's dedicated um that you can't technically use say so it's on your property but you're not allowed to use it so while a lot of see uh if you see a couple lots in a row and there's a road going down the middle that's probably an easement cut through all the other parcels so you can access easements can also be for utilities storm drains, all sorts of things can fall in that easement, but it's a piece of your land that you can't use um, because there's been dedicated as a right of way for something else. Yeah, it makes sense. So, you know, what's really impressive that I've always thought about you is um, you got into this probably at the worst time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like seriously, you got into it during like COVID when all that happened and um same with me. I got into real estate at the same time and I made a, a mistake of taking on projects that I wanted to like add stuff. So I needed to get permits and stuff with the, with, um, the city. Um, so one, one property, I was converting a garage to a, a fourth bedroom so I could have that fourth bedroom to chase bigger comps, which it ended up working out. I made like 50 grand on the property, but I could have made a little less and done it a hell of a lot quicker. So I yeah. probably, it probably just would have made sense to not do that. My point is during that time to get things approved, permits and all this stuff that you talk about was so difficult because a lot of people just weren't working. So to get things with the, the red stamp approval, it just took forever. Right. And you've crushed it through having to go through all those things. And now it's a little bit easier, right? It's easier to get things through with the city and everything like that. So, um, are you guys seeing that reflect in, in business? So there's a little bit of a yin and yang there. While it was harder to get stuff through the city during COVID interest rates were a lot better for builders. So they were willing to take stuff earlier on in the process. We didn't even have to get stuff fully entitled. We just had to get through preliminary approvals and the mm -hmm. city say, yes, we're in favor of this project. And we had people gobbling stuff up. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, we did one where we just got preliminary approvals, sold off a site for a 72 unit apartment complex, and we made 400,000 on the deal uh, just because of how great interest rates were and the builder was so confident in the site compared to now with interest rates being so high, those numbers are smaller and we're having to get more approvals uh, so builders can come in and start building because they don't know where interest rates are going to go. Some people believe we've got some easing coming and it's going to come down, but every builder I talk to is not using that for underwriting. They're predicting worst case scenario and it's going back up. So that's mm -hmm. why they want stuff I can start building now compared to six months from now when I don't know where my debt's actually going to land at. So it's it's been a little bit of a yin and yang. It was harder to get permits and approvals, 
but people are willing to take more risk because of cheap debt. Now with high debt, they want, you know, uh, approvals fully done, which is the city still is uh, like lagging behind with the amount of stuff that they have residual from COVID. We're still seeing a lot of um, issues getting planned, pushed through just because they're so backlogged. Man, I'm hoping that rates drop. Yeah. I, mean, Man, every- I am hoping. That. <laughs> yeah. Good Lord. Because I have like, uh, I have this um, theory of what's going to happen with the markets if rates drop. What, is, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we'd probably see another, we'd probably see another, we'd see some runaway inflation. We'd see some uh, builders start going crazy again, which would be good because we still have a uh, pretty heavy demand. That's something that Ken McElroy has been talking about pretty heavily, who he owns MC companies with his partner, Ross McAllister. They, I believe, have uh, 20,000 doors, 10 to 20,000 doors, something like that, a couple billion in assets. And they're, they build a lot of the larger multifamily. And they're saying, if you can hold on to land right now for the next two to three years, it's going to be triple its value just because there's nobody building right now. If you look at building permits, we're over 50% down year over year because a lot of people don't know where the market's going, so they don't even want to build. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the builders that were going gangbusters have all shut down. So there's going to be a big supply curve uh, inverse as supply keeps going up and demand or so demand keeps going up and supply keeps dropping because nobody's building. So that's going to be a very interesting time because we had a ton of multifamily come online over these last few years and kind of flood the market. That's what's caused uh, the rental rates to come down a little for multifamily. But if you look at the building trend, it's dropping drastically. So it's going to create that supply demand curve and we're going to see a lot of a lot of demand, not a lot of supply. Yeah. So prices will push up. Um, dude, I'm like, I'm seriously like fingers crossed it happens. Cause we have, we have a property that, uh, an Airbnb of ours, we were doing quite a few Airbnbs and anyone out there who's thinking about doing Airbnb, um, I might be the, not like the best person to take this advice from, but just personal advice. I think it is so much work. It is literally a, um, it's a hospitality business. You have to be on the ball at all times, or you hire someone that is, and then you're giving up 25, 30% of your gross rents. Yeah. It's a lot of money. So, um, I would self-manage all of them. So I'm not giving up that, that 25, 30%. And it just got ridiculous. Like people would ask the dumbest freaking questions, bro. I would get people asking where the thermostat is. It's that thing on the wall. It's about yay big. Yeah. It's a circular object on the wall. Eye level. And they're like, oh, found it. <laughs> like, just ridiculous. So we sold off a bunch of them. There's one that we have still that um, we tried selling it and we just couldn't because the buyer pool at the size of that property is smaller. Just cause it's a, it's a higher end property. Right. The buy pool is already smaller. And then when you look at what interest rates are, six, seven, eight percent, whatever they are right now on a 30 year mortgage, on that size of a property, the payment is like eight grand a month. That even that shrinks the buy pool even more. And a lot of people will just wait until rates are, are lower because that same property with a lower rate is like five thousand a month. Right. So I'm excited for it to drop because if it drops, the interest rates drop. Most likely, like you said, values will go up. So we could sell it pretty easily because people can afford a higher um, a higher price with a lower rate. And then we make a little bit of profit. So fingers crossed, bro. Fingers crossed. When do you think that would happen if it happens? So it's supposed to have happened three times this year already, but due to uh, the inflation numbers that keep coming back, they keep prolonging it. They say we should have one Q4 of this year, but I'm, I don't think so. We're, Ray Dalio's book, uh, Navigating Big Debt Crises, is amazing, and he kind of mm-hmm. laid this out on where he thinks this is going to go and how they should do a soft landing if they're going to do it, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like they're following his book at all, and his biggest fear is us entering into a period of stagflation, which is where we kind of are high interest rates, high inflation, nothing's really moving. Hopefully, uh, with the change in the White House, we'll see some uh, some different policies come through that could help, you know, the American people get the economy going again, because it does feel like we're entering into a, a recessionary period right now. 
Uh, I know a lot of small businesses are starting to feel it. I know there's a lot of layoffs going on in some bigger companies. So it seems like we're entering into something like that and we need to pull some levers and switches to turn it around. But I would love to see something. It, we'll see if the Fed stays true to their word. They said end of this year, but uh, they've also pushed off the last two. So it's it's hard to say where they're going to go. Yeah, I love Ray's stuff. Ray Dalio is a just financial wizard. Um, exactly. I follow big on like Austrian economics. Are you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. So for anyone that's not familiar with Austrian economics, can you give them like a brief synopsis of what it is? That's on you. You're, okay. you're the finance guy. I'm not, I'm going to mess that all up. Well, guys, Austrian economics, quite, quite simple. Like our economics in the U S is based on abundance. Like if you look around, look at how many cars there are, look at how many you go into any store, any, um, mall, there's just abundance of products. So our, our economy is based on abundance. This is why the federal government prints more money because they figure if they print more, they give people more money, they'll spend more, which is true. But here's what happens. When you do that, you devalue the dollar. So think about this. If I put this $100 in the bank and if it was printed from the federal government, it's 100 bucks that didn't exist before. So it's already devaluing all the other dollars. And then if I put it in the bank, the bank, because of fractional reserve lending, can actually take this and lend out a multiple of it, creating more money out of thin air, just more dollars in circulation, devaluing all the other dollars. So that's how inflation really takes place. Um, it's by creating money out of thin air through the Federal Reserve and the fractional reserve banking. Austrian economics is based on scarcity. So if you really think about it, Everything is scarce. There's only so much water on planet Earth. There's only so so much gold. There's only so much minerals. There's only so much everything. Resources are scarce. Money should be no different. So Austrian economics is more around that. I think, I personally think, if we followed more of Austrian economics, there wouldn't be an issue in the U.S. with inflation. And the markets would kind of self-correct themselves through what people need at that time. So perfect example, if something happens and the economy takes a dip and there's no no more need for XYZ employees, whoever it is, they're going to get laid off. Instead of the Fed stepping in and trying to put a bandaid on that problem, guess what's going to happen? another industry, another sector is going to start doing well because of need. And then guess what? There's going to be more jobs in that sector. So those people that got laid off are going to naturally go to that. So um, I would highly advise everyone to like research Austrian economics. It is, I think, the kind of the cure to all the crap that goes on the booms and busts of the market. So that's what our original setup was. We were uh, like an Austrian economic model originally because the dollar was pegged to the gold, the gold Mm -hmm. standard. And as soon as we took ourselves off of that, uh, it started spiraling down very quickly because we now the the only thing backing the currency is our military might saying, if you don't (laughs) like our dollar, we'll come find oil on your uh, in your country. But. So I think we should start heading back to something like that. We really need to start auditing where our money's going. And welfare is now surpassed military spending in this country, which is pretty wild. It It's unsustainable for the, the long-term health of our country. We really have to find a different model and stop just stop printing money. I know the Fed started doing some quantitative tightening where they're pulling some money out of the market to try to stop this hyperinflation, but it seems like it's uh, a little too little, too late, if you will. Um, We'll see how it shakes out and hopefully Ray Dalio is wrong and we don't enter into the next Great Depression. Um, But uh, it's it's hard to see. If we do, though, guess what? Everything is going to be at a heavy discount. Exactly. So if you're cash positive, it's going to be a buying opportunity like no other. But there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering, unfortunately, for those that aren't as we navigate this space. But the government, every time something goes wrong, they just keep throwing that money printer and it just goes burr, uh, pun intended. (laughs) 
So guys, it's so funny because uh, our economy is based off, like I was saying, just um, abundance. Print, print, print. Spend, 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 spend. Um, the second we stop spending, the economy slows. Austrian economics is based off saving. So as you save, um, you're taking away from one person's income. Because if I spend money, like if I go buy this phone, right? I spent money on this phone. That's income for Apple, right? So you're taking away from one person's income if you save. However, if you save, what's the rule? Who He who holds the gold makes the rules, right? Yep. So I'm actually big on saving. You guys know I do infinite banking. Infinite banking, a key part of it is accumulation, accumulating a stockpile of money in specially designed whole life policies. I've saved a ton of money in these policies, but then I can leverage them and borrow against them. So I'm still saving that money. It's still growing and compounding. I can just borrow against it and go make more money with it and then pay back my loan against my money. Here's the thing. As you save more, the more money you have, opportunity finds you. So if there's a great, uh, like a second great depression or what have you, things are going to go like this on prices. You're going to be able to get stuff at like pennies on the dollar. Therefore, if you have the gold, you can start buying things up at a discount. That's when great, great fortunes are made are during depressions and recessions. So part of me doesn't want it to happen, but part of me is like, fingers crossed it does because I'm ready. And And for people that are like, well, I don't have money and you know, uh, I, I used to have this fallacy where I was like, well, I don't have any money, you know, and I'll, I'll think about saving in the future. No, you got to start right now. You got to set up a policy. You got to start putting money away because the more money you are putting away to the less money you have sitting in a regular account that now that new TV comes out, that new Xbox comes out. If the cash isn't readily available, you're less likely to blow it. And that's just knowing the difference between assets and liabilities. Like, do I really need that new whatever widget? Or can I put that money into something that's going to be compounding every year over year growing and now I can take advantage. And some people are like, well, you know, I, I can't afford to set that aside, learn a skill then, because when that market goes crash, a lot of those investors sitting on the sideline, that are cash heavy are going to be wanting these deals. And if you know how to find those deals for them, you're going to be able to make some money and start stacking that up. And now you can start saving. It's all about learning that new skill set and being able to provide value. If you don't have the money, you better have the time. And if you have uh, the money, then uh, you can leverage somebody else's time. But get proficient in that skill set of finding these deals. Um, it's not even just real estate. I mean, it's going to be everywhere. Uh, get as close to the money as possible. And uh, it kind of goes, you know, banking, real estate, everything else. So if you can get into real estate and banking, you're uh, you're going to be set long term. Well, dude, that that's how the government or that's how the economy runs. Like if if we don't have the banking or the real estate, everything crashes. So if you can control the banking aspect in your life and then also take that banking aspect, so you're controlling the banking in your life, which is infinite banking, what I teach. If you have control of that, not Wells Fargo, Chase, what have you, you're making money as the banker and then you take it and buy real estate. Now you're buying something that has real value, real intrinsic value that has amazing tax benefits right? So let's talk about that. Some of the tax benefits of real estate. So unfortunately on the land side, there are none. We don't get really? the, the only time we can do any sort of bonus depreciation is if there's a structure on the property that we demo. Because oh. otherwise, if we're buying land, I've tried to find a way to do this. Every CPA says I'm going to get audited if I do it. But I always try to say, hey, I'm buying land. It's technically inventory then I have to entitle it and sell it. So why can't we just classify it as inventory and depreciate or, you know, write that off? And they said, yeah, no, it's, it's not how it works with land, unfortunately. So the downside when you're doing land is you're not really getting any of those tax benefits compared to single family houses, stuff like that. Um, or if anybody finds a way to do that, please let me know in the comments because I am, I've gone to four different CPAs and they all say I'm going to end up audited and owing a bunch of money because it's uh, not doable. But that's yeah. why taking that earned income though and putting it into, you know, physical real estate, uh, rental properties, commercial properties, something with a structure on it that you can appreciate is super helpful. And how does that work? Bonus depreciation and all that kind of stuff. 
so I, I know very high level at it. I didn't go into the weeds. So that's why I paid good CPAs, but the bonus depreciation, you basically buy a property that has a structure on it, you demo it, and you can depreciate fully the cost of that building over those first couple of years. And that's a, so that's why the teardowns are pretty nice. And that's why a lot of builders go after the teardowns in like Paradise Valley and stuff like that, because they can bonus depreciate that structure that they just demoed, which helps on the tax savings. Yeah. So guys, depreciation is an incredible thing because you figure everything wears out. That's that's what depreciation basically is, is if you have a, a property, it's going to depreciate over time its value. Um, I forget the exact year. I think it's 26 years you can depreciate. Something it's like, like a calculation. I forget exactly how it works. I'm not a CPA, so this is not advice. This yeah. is, <laughs> um, so don't hold us legally accountable. But um, basically, guys, when you do depreciation, you can do bonus depreciation, where if you are in uh, a real estate professional, which again, I forget the exact um, amount of time you need to be spending in real estate for to qualify. So speak with your CPA. Um, I think it's 100 hours. I could be wrong on that. But if you are considered a real estate professional, you can depreciate the entire cost of that building the first year, which is crazy. So you can literally have it offset all of your earned income and everything to where you pay zero taxes if you buy enough of them. Only problem is you have, um, uh, I think it's called recapture, where when you sell that property, you have to kind of systematically pay that tax at that point. So again, don't quote me on any of this. I'm not a CPA, but it is a huge, huge benefit if you plan to keep properties long term. So it sucks you can't do that with land though. I didn't know that. Yeah, we haven't found a way yet. And I keep going to new CPAs hoping they're going to have the, the holy grail. And we just have not found anything that we can do yet just because it's just raw land and they it's a different asset class according to the government. I guess it makes sense because land doesn't like depreciate. Like Exactly. There, there's nothing on it that is, you know, falling apart over time that you'd have to depreciate, unfortunately. But hmm. so it is a very, uh, so there is, that's why a lot of guys in the land space do a lot of 1031s, uh, you mm -hmm. know, they'll sell a property and just keep rolling that um, and kicking that can down the road uh, on the tax liability. That's 1031s are pretty big in land. Uh, just to try to avoid that that capital gains hit. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, you just got to kind of bite the bullet and then try to go find something like a rental property or something you can sink the money into and, and get that uh, depreciation elsewhere. Guys, one way you can do this, I learned this somewhat recently, you can avoid that capital gains that he's talking about through getting a self-directed Roth IRA. Crazy. So, Think about like, most people know what an IRA is. It's a retirement vehicle. Yeah. Um, so you can have a Roth IRA, which is you pay your taxes now, you never pay them again. So let's say you put just using easy numbers, $100,000 of post-tax dollars into a Roth IRA. Now that money, if it's self-directed, you decide what it's invested in. So I can go from my self-directed IRA, buy a piece of land, and let's say I wholesale it and I make 50 racks. So now I've got 150 grand. Normally that $50,000 would, um, would be taxed. However, in a Roth IRA, that 50 grand is now non-taxable. It's in the IRA. It's grown tax-free for your retirement. And then when you use it after you're 59 and a half, there's no taxation either. It's incredible. Yeah, the self-directed IRAs are crazy. Do you know much about those or no? No, it's something I've heard about and I need to really look into more because it just sounds like a, a pretty powerful tool if used correctly, especially with a, you know the line of work we're in with high tax liabilities at the end of the year. Yeah, it's huge, guys. And if you have to have certain things in order to do it, so like you can you can convert um, like a current four hundred one k or IRA. You just can't be employed at the company. So if, you ha if you're working at a company and you have a 401k, unfortunately, you can't convert that until you're no longer employed. Reason being is when you're employed, you don't own that 401k. Right. The employer does. That's the crazy part. So once you resign, now you actually own the 401k, you own the money or what have you. Then you can convert it over. So 
guys, I'll uh, I'll put in the notes um, a link where you can schedule a call with a good friend of mine, his company, Greg Herlean. It's Horizon Trust, and um, they can help you convert over old 401ks, old IRAs, and um, you can, again, just start investing and controlling where your money goes for retirement. Because right now, in a retirement account, you probably have no idea where the money's going. You have no idea what's going on. It's always been the biggest worry of mine is not knowing who's handling your money. Yeah, dude. And the less control you have, the more risk you have. If you think about it, if you're driving a car and your brakes go out, you've lost control of stopping the car. What happens to your risk of crashing? Goes way up. So the more control you have with anything, money, a car, a bicycle, whatever it is, the more control you have, the less risk you have. So with a self-directed IRA, you guys have full control over your retirement. Like I said, I'll put in the notes where you guys can schedule a call with, uh, with Horizon Trust. But um, yeah, man, aside from that, uh, how can people get a hold of you and learn more from you and all that good stuff? So I, I've got uh, the YouTube, uh, AD Pappas on there, uh, Instagram, AD Pappas as well. Uh, Facebook, Anthony Pappas, uh, more than happy to answer any questions as I can. I do take a little time to respond just because I'm starting to get a lot more questions frequently and kind of have to work through the list when I have time. But I, this has been uh, life changing for me. I never thought I'd make more than, you know, 100K a year, especially when I was plumbing, working my ass off to make 65 grand a year. And then you just have to be willing to take that leap and get out of your comfort zone and go learn something new. And uh, the sky is really the limit. I mean, it's been, I feel blessed to be where I am today. Oh yeah. The, the, the first hundred grand is the hardest in my opinion. It really is. Cause it seems like it's not obtainable. It just seems like, oh, it's uh, something that happens to other people. And then you get into wholesale and you get it done in three or four deals. And you're like, what was I so worried about? The next thing you know, now you have cash to invest into deals and you can take a loss and it doesn't even matter. It's just depreciation off your taxes for that year. Uh, yep. It's, 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 we're blessed to be in the life we're in and not try to pay it forward as much as possible because a lot of people help me get where I'm at. That's the other thing too, is you don't have to do it alone. There's tons of books, podcasts, um, YouTube channels, putting out so much information and uh, you just have to get out there and put in the work. If you put down the Netflix and pick up, you know, a podcast, or if you put down, uh, you know, going to the bar with the buddies and pick up a book that your future will reflect that it's a show me how you spend your time and I'll show you a future type quote. That's powerful. Um, that's why I love all you guys on here. Cause you, you're spending time to better yourself. You're listening to this in order to learn and become better. Um, Anthony kind of hit it right on the head is like, you can, you can spend time one of two ways. I've said this many times. You can spend time entertaining yourself. So Netflix, um, video games, uh, going to the bar, that's all entertainment. You're entertaining yourself with your time. Or you can spend your time educating yourself, learning a skill, reading a book, watching a YouTube. Um, as you guys can see, I've got a, a good amount of books behind me. I've read every one of these books a couple times. I highly recommend when you guys read a book, don't go to the next book read that book again right away. So that way you, it really sinks in. And if you're not a reader, do audible, listen to the book. As soon as it's done, go to chapter one, listen through it again, learn, 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 become a better version of yourself because the better you are, the more valuable you are, the more value you have to give and money, success, wealth, accumulation, it follows value. The more value you give, the more you will have, period. So I'm a firm believer of that, and I know you are too, so I love that you're paying it forward. Um, what's like one thing you would tell the listeners um, or the watchers if they're watching this on YouTube? Um, like one thing you would tell them if if you knew you were going to pass away, God forbid this doesn't happen, but <laughs> but you knew you were going to pass away in 10 minutes. Yep. What's the one thing you would leave them with that you think would change their lives? Start today. Don't put it off till next week. Don't put it off till next year. Uh, you know, I'll start going to the gym when I get in shape type attitude. You have to start doing it today and then don't fall into the trap 
of just buying the nice things until you build the company or the system or the processes that will pay for that and it doesn't affect you. That's what something you did really well is you didn't splurge on all the luxury stuff until you built your system and your process to now where you can get the nice Porsche and stuff and it doesn't affect your bottom line. I, I swear every time I see you got a new Rolex and you're able to do that without worry because the system you've created is just passive income. Learn the difference between assets and liabilities build up those assets so then you can buy all the liabilities you want without worrying about you know the bill because it's a really good feeling when there's cash flow coming in from properties and you can go spend that on whatever you want knowing it's not going to affect your life in any way possible or save it up and reinvest it or do a mix of both which i think you and i both do uh you like Love watches it. i like my guns and night vision um <laughs> But yeah, building that up and because of the properties that I have notes on for vacant land and it's just paying me every single month, now I can go splurge on stuff that I want to enjoy without the fear of it because so many people get caught in that trap of make money, spend money, make money, save money, invest money, spend that money that's already been made. And this is not an idea I came up with a lot of smarter people and it's from those books that are behind you. These are ideas we can stand on the shoulders of giants if we are willing to put in the work and listen to their words. I would need a ladder, but hey, you know, um, we're, both, we're both vertically challenged, dude. Uh, yeah. So guys, Anthony, we didn't touch on this at all, but Anthony is the guy that if there's a zombie apocalypse, I'm driving straight to his house. Like dude has every gun you could think of night vision goggles, does tactical training on just crazy stuff. Um, I think you're like a black belt as well, right? Black belt in Taekwondo, blue belt in Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, the world's changing. Taekwondo used to be a cooler thing with Power Rangers and Chuck Norris movies, but it's uh, it's not as good of an art form compared to like Muay Thai and some Jiu-Jitsu ground game. But always a student of uh, martial arts. It's a, it's a, it's a good hobby because once again, you're making yourself harder to kill, wealthier, smarter. It all just ties into each other. Yeah, and again, guys, I'd said it a second ago. Success, accumulation, money, wealth, it follows value. So if there's a zombie apocalypse, who's going to be the most successful in that situation? Probably Anthony. And the reason why is because he has the most value. People are going to like come to him because they don't want to die. <laughs> so guys, work on yourself. Work on yourself a lot like unproportionally work on yourself. Um, think about like the last time you bought a car, you probably researched the hell out of that car. You, you found out everything there was to know about that car, what sensors it has, what, what speed limit it shuts the engine off, what the zero to 60 is, what the leaders of the motor are, what the CCs, whatever you learned everything about that car. Yep. How much do you know about yourself? How much have you researched yourself? How much have you studied yourself? Work on you. Everything else will fall into place. So, dude, it's been a blast, man. We've, I don't know how we've already been chatting up for an hour, like the fastest hour ever. Yeah. Um, but one thing I just wanted to say real quick, I remember this in 2021, it kind of speaks on what we just talked about. Do you remember when you and I were like, man, it'd be so cool to go to a dealership and just look at a car and be like, I can buy that car cash. Yep. And we were talking about Ferraris or something like that. And um, I remember, uh, I think we were at Jesse Burrell's house at like a um, Halloween party. And you're like, dude, I did it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I was at the Ferrari dealership. I was looking at this Ferrari. It was 450 grand and I could have bought it cash. Yep. And I'm like, dude, congrats. And I was like, did you buy it? You're like, no, that'd be stupid. <laughs> I bought a bunch of land instead. We'll see if that's yeah. a better idea. I don't know. So the Ferraris are appreciating so quickly. It might have might have been a better investment. Yeah, you could have flipped it real quick. But um, yeah, dude, I love it. So many gems dropped. Um, so guys, go check out Anthony on all of his stuff. Follow him on YouTube. I'm going to put all of his, uh, his handles in the description. Uh, if you got value from this, I'm sure you did. Make sure to pay it forward. Share with as many people as you know. Because again, as we all grow, we get better together. And any comments you guys have, put them in the comment section. If you are watching this on YouTube, I'll make sure to get back to all of them. If I don't know the answer, 
I will ask this man because he knows it. I'm not big on land. He is. So guys, until next time, I love y'all. Peace.